The Battle of Cannae is one of the most fascinating in world history. In this epic battle, the third major battle of Hannibal Barca's Italian campaigns, the fate of Rome is very much in the balance. We're going to explore the battle. We're also going to explore the outcomes of the battle and give you the choice. What would you do following the Battle of Cannae? Let's talk about Hannibal's strategy for the Carthaginians. The idea was Hannibal understands that the power of the Roman military is its sheer numbers. The key, though, is to understand that Rome itself is not that large. Rome is just a city-state, but it has successfully conquered all the neighboring peoples. Those neighboring peoples have grown restive under brutal Roman rule. They do not want to be under Rome's control. Here is the strategy. Hannibal is going to invade Italy. He's going to inflict such heavy damage upon the Romans that the individuals that have been subjected by the Romans will rise up and will join him. This is a key piece of the strategy for Hannibal. Here's the problem. You have an army in the field. An army in the field needs to sustain itself. Generally, an invading army simply takes what it can from farmers, from whatever else. It just, it plunders the land as it goes. Think about this. Hannibal has a foreign army in a foreign field and he's attempting to win the friendship of the people. That is a challenge. You cannot steal from the folks you're trying to win the friendship of. He needs to keep this in mind. So once again, the strategy, inflict heavy losses upon the Romans. Once those losses are achieved, the rest of the Italians will rise up against the Romans. We'll see if this works. It's August 2nd, 216 BC at a small grain depot named Cannae, very close to the Adriatic Sea, just a bit south but to the east of Rome. This will be the site of the epic battle. If you like what we're doing here, please click the button below and subscribe. Also, if you have any comments, please leave those. We would love to dialogue about these exciting historical topics. And now the Battle of Cannae. All right, so check out the battle plan on that fateful day. Understand the Romans believe that this battle is going to be won in the center. They have packed as many men as possible, actually in deeper columns in the center to make that possible. The Romans uh, use heavy infantry. They have the best heavy infantry in the world. The idea is to drive right through the center. They fear the Carthaginian cavalry. So what we have is we have double column Roman infantry supported by Roman infantry on the side, which really are only there to shield. And then in the exterior, we have the Roman cavalry. The Roman cavalry, once again, is as far inferior to the Carthaginians. The idea was simply to protect the wings. Also very fascinating, the Roman consuls, the leaders of the Romans on that day, were stationed with the cavalry, which was on the edges. This is going to have an important fact. Now, what's also fascinating, that day, the Carthaginians had, in a strange way, the absolutely opposite plan. The idea of Hannibal was to uh, have his least experienced troops, his Gauls, his Iberians, in the front center. What he did is he placed his very experienced uh, African troops as well as, as his experienced Spaniards on the side infantry, and then he had his cavalry on the wings. The idea here was to be thin in the middle, thick on the outside, just the opposite of the Romans. Let's see what the strategy does for both. Some other really important considerations for that day Hannibal has again chosen the battlefield. He usually draws his opponents to him. He's done again that day. What he's done is he has placed a river at his left. It's to the right of the Romans. Also, very important, uh, the sun is at Hannibal's back. The idea is that the Romans are staring right into the sun as this battle begins. The Romans have 86,000 men that they've mustered for this battle. They've chosen to put 10,000 back at a rear camp with the intent that once the battle is engaged, those 10,000 men can be used to raid the Carthaginian supplies with the idea that the Carthaginians are already stretched beyond their logistic capacity. They're thinking ahead. 70, so there's 76,000 men now that the Romans are working with. The Carthaginians have 50,000 men. So we've got 76,000 versus the 50,000 as we begin this battle. Leadership. This was stated before, but I need to state it again. Uh, the Roman consuls have chosen to be at the wings with the cavalry. Where is Hannibal Barca in all of this? Right in the center. He's behind his thin line. He is in a position where he can deploy troops. He can make decisions when necessary. This is going to have a key, a key outcome on this battle. There are two Roman consuls on the field that day, Vero and Paulus. And you got to love these Roman names, Lucius Aemilius Paulus and Gaius Tarentus Vero. Fascinating fact. 
Now remember, Rome is a republic. As a republic, they have elections each year. Now the top elected official in Rome is something called a consul. There were two consuls elected each year. The idea is that they're a check on each other's power. The Romans had a profound fear of too much power being concentrated in one individual. These individuals provided a check on each other. Now, that works well during peace situations, correct? But during war, when you have to have a command structure, which is very clear, you cannot have a dual command. So in Rome, what would happen is when in the field, when at war, one consul would be in charge each day. They would switch back and forth. This fact will have a profound impact on the Battle of Condon. The Romans had a dual command structure. This was not a problem for the Carthaginians. The Carthaginians and their allies, the Iberians, the Celts, the Gauls, they were under the firm control of Hannibal Barca, who had been raised to be a soldier since his earliest days, trained by his father Hamilcar with one end in mind. Destroy Rome. Let's get this stop motion battle started. Let's get this stop motion battle started. So we have the Romans with an overwhelming superiority of infantry in the center. On the wings we have the cavalry. On the Roman right, the Carthaginian cavalry advances and hits the Roman cavalry hard, driving it from the field with one of its consuls. Not a good beginning for the Romans. On the Roman left, the Carthaginian uh, cavalry again advances and hits the Roman cavalry, driving it from the field. The Roman cavalry has been absolutely outclassed this point so far. The Roman wings are exposed, and both consuls, the leaders of the army, have effectively been driven from the field. But remember, the Romans believe this battle will be won in the center. The Romans still are confident. The Carthaginians advance, forming a convex line. This convex line presents a very enticing target for the Romans, as the Carthaginian front is very, very thin. The Romans advance. As the Romans advance, they hit the Carthaginian center hard. This is where the Romans begin to do their work. They are heavy heavy infantrymen, some of the best in the ancient world. They are pushing and pushing and pushing. The Carthaginians begin to fall back in the center. What the Romans do not realize is the Carthaginian strategy is to allow their center to slowly fall back while holding firm on the wings. The intent is to use the overwhelming superiority of Roman numbers against them. The Carthaginian wings begin to come around and envelop the Romans. The Carthaginian cavalry, which had been victorious on the Roman right, now begins to swing across the entire field to help their comrades in the other edge of the battlefield to drive the other cavalry from the field entirely. This is becoming a disaster for the Romans. Now the Romans are encircled on three sides. They are now becoming so crowded their formations are falling apart. They're falling over one another. Uh, they are having a very difficult time fighting just in the sheer congested nature of it. Now the trap is absolutely sprung with the Roman cavalry driven from the field. The Carthaginian cavalry is free to come and form as the fourth side of the square. The Romans are now absolutely boxed in. What began as a battle is now a massacre. The Romans with 76,000 men absolutely smashed upon one another, unable to form, some actually unable to draw their swords, are massacred this day absolute complete and total victory by the carthaginians absolute carnage if you were hannibal barca what would you do but first fascinating fact it was a custom for roman men to wear rings the commoners wore iron rings aristocracy golden rings remember there are seventy-six thousand carcasses on the field that day hannibal had his men strip the dead romans of their rings those rings were put in baskets which were sent back to carthage as a display of the magnitude of the victory, those baskets of thousands and thousands and thousands of rings were poured on the floor of the Carthaginian Senate as a display of the victory. You're Hannibal Barca. You just crushed the Romans. It's decision time. What would you do? You've got three options. Option number one. You're Hannibal Barca. You just inflicted the heaviest loss the Romans have ever experienced. This is the third major loss. Understand the Romans have been defeated in two major battles before this. They've just lost 76,000 men killed on the field. 10,000 men captured, absolutely obliterated. Option one, do you march on Rome? Do you get your men together at this point, gather supplies and march straight to Rome and besiege the capital? Option number two.
Option number two is Hannibal Barca. Your original strategy, invade Italy, have such a crushing impact on them in battle to destroy them to the level. Remember, you just killed 76,000 Romans that the neighboring peoples will rise up. Do you, at this point, march to all the neighboring cities, get their allegiance, and then wait for the Romans to come to you to sue for peace because all of their peoples have risen up? Option number three. You have just crushed the Romans. There's nothing standing in your way. You take this opportunity to subjugate the surrounding peoples, to actually to go around to the surrounding provinces that Rome had conquered, conquer them yourselves, and use them as a base to attack Rome. You don't care if they're your allies, you now have the means to conquer them, and you just do so. If you chose option number two, that's exactly what Hannibal did. Remember Hannibal's overall strategy, invade mainland Italy. Once in Italy, inflict such crushing defeats on the Romans that they are forced to capitulate. This is the third major defeat the Romans have faced. 76,000 men dead on the field, 10,000 men captured, crushing. Instead of marching on Rome, Hannibal decides that what he's going to do is he's gonna to march to neighboring city-states and allow them to come over to his side. He does this and they do. He waits for Rome now to simply send out delegates and to capitulate. This is interesting. Hannibal was a tactical genius, no question about it. Strategically, however, he absolutely counted on the Romans submitting. When they did not submit, he did not know what to do. Strategically, this was a failure for Hannibal. 13 years later, after tremendous hardship and a, a terribly, terribly long war, Rome would win this war. After the crushing defeats, Rome would win this war. Rome loses battles. Rome never loses a war. Historians have speculated since, had Hannibal on that fateful day gathered his army and marched on Rome, would world history be different? You decide. Please hit the subscribe button below and leave any comments you may have. A new video will be posted every Tuesday. This channel presents the greatest military, political, social, and ethical dilemmas in history and offers you the chance to decide what would you do. If you love history and the fascinating what-ifs of history, then this channel is for you.